In our previous lecture, we discussed archaeology in the ancient Near East, and I brought up the question of terminology. Should the practice of archaeology in that area be called Near Eastern archaeology or biblical archaeology? This is a controversy that raged throughout the late 19th and 20th centuries, and in some sense is still with us today. We also discussed ideological issues revolving around the practice of archaeology. Today, we will discuss one aspect of archaeology, the deciphering of inscriptions and the reading of texts. So language and the principles of writing systems are what we will focus on. From the late 18th century onwards, scholars, explorers, and adventurers in the Near East copied and collected inscriptions. They found these inscriptions on rocks. There were some really heroic attempts to climb up on rocks, some of them successful. And it took weeks. British explorers would copy these large inscriptions on paper. And imagine copying inscriptions, which meant nothing to you. They had to copy them, take them back to Europe, and eventually, through a long process, they were understood and deciphered. They took these inscriptions from the surfaces of tombs and palaces, and they found them on the clay tablets, which were scattered in the ruins throughout the Near East. In this lecture, we will speak about these inscriptions that were found in the 19th century, and we will explain the principles on which these writing systems were based. By way of doing so, I will also look at the way that the peoples of the Near East in antiquity explained the origins of writing. That is, I'm going to oppose two ideas, the way we understand the origins of writing and the way the ancients understood the origins of writing. Once ancient Egyptian and the cuneiform languages of Mesopotamia were deciphered, scholars could see that there were common principles. They look very different when you look at these scripts, cuneiform and hieroglyphs. But when you understand the principles upon which they are based, you'll see that there are many similarities. And in fact, we think there were mutual influences between cuneiform and hieroglyphic. Most recently, and here I mean in the last decade or two, scholars have been focusing on what we might call the prehistory of writing, the proto-literate period, the period in which the writing systems were evolving. And these scholars have been collecting, analyzing, and identifying markings, tokens, seal cylinders, and other objects on which there was some type of writing, although not a completely developed writing system. So let us go back to the ancient Near East and look at some of the ideas about writing. In 300 BC, writing in Greek, the Babylonian scholar and scribe Barassus penned a myth about writing. Again, myth. He didn't mean that it was false, hearkening back to our discussion of what myth means. A myth that is an origins story, a story that explains where writing came from. In Babylonia, a number of people came to install themselves in Chaldea, the part of lower Mesopotamia that borders on the Persian Gulf, where they lived an irreligious life similar to that of animals. Let me interject something into Barassus's felicitous prose. Without writing and without the arts of civilization, humans are seen like animals. And they are irreligious. That, that is, they don't have a spiritual life. In the first year, an extraordinary monster appeared on the shores of the Red Sea, and its name was Oannes. Its entire body was that of a fish, and underneath his head was a second one, that is, a second head, as well as feet similar to that of a man, an image that is still remembered and that is still depicted for us today. This being lived among people without eating anything, and he taught them. He taught them writing first, and science 
and technology of all types, the foundation of cities, the building of temples, jurisprudence, and geometry. He also revealed to them how to cultivate grains and how to harvest fruits. In short, he gave them all that constitutes civilized life. He did it so well that ever since no one has found anything exceptional in it. When the sun set, the monster Oannes plunged back into the sea to pass the night in the water because he was amphibious. Later, similar creatures appeared. What a wonderful story. So writing and the arts of civilization came from a supernatural being. It emerged from the sea. It brought these arts. And note the artistry of the story. It doesn't end that way. The monster has to go back into the sea. He brings the message and he go, goes back to, to the place from where he came. Now, this is a fantastic story, and not all the ancient stories about language are like this, but they're all um, very imaginative and entertaining. Note that this is a text written in Greek. The Greeks and the Romans ascribed the arts of civilization to the Egyptians and the Babylonians. They themselves wrote about the cultural achievements of these peoples. The Babylonians had a myth similar to the one described by Barassus. That is, Barassus is to be believed. This Greek account is to be believed. Now, he embellishes it somewhat, and he probably didn't understand everything he was told, but they did have this idea that Enki, or Ea, the god, brought writing to humanity. There's another myth, which we will study in detail later in our series, about a king named Enmeg. Merkar, N. Merkar of the Sumerians, who invents writing for a specific circumstance. That is, there was a day during his reign was when there wasn't writing, and he had a need for it, and he invented it. So they had this notion of, okay, you could come up with writing. Now, the idea that writing was a secret that had to be revealed was something that the ancients spoke about, but it's also something that existed in Europe until pre-modern times. And it was linked to the idea of biblical revelation. In the Bible, God appears to the people of Israel, this is in the book of Exodus, and reveals the law. He gives them the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are written on tablets. They are described in great detail. The language of the account is Hebrew. The common understanding of this story is that Hebrew was the language of Revelation. That's only natural because of the language of the text. So the idea developed that the first language and the first script was Hebrew and that this was revealed and given by God. This idea of Hebrew as the original language is based on two factors. One, this idea of revelation. Another, on the idea of creation. Because in Genesis, the world and all its components and humanity are created by speech. God spoke and things came into being. Well, if he spoke, he used language, didn't he? And that language must have been Hebrew. So Hebrew was, to use the Latin phrase, and this was said by Jerome, by St. Jerome, was the prima lingua. It was original language, the first language. Another aspect of this Genesis connection to the original language story is the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 which opens this way, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. So all humanity spoke one language. Then as the story unfolds, as people try to build a tower to the heavens, they are punished in two ways. They are scattered on the face of the earth and, quote, their language is confounded. So here we have an origins narrative, a myth, Again, in the sense of a story embodying a certain truth. 
that explains two very basic questions about humanity. It's a question that children, bright children often ask. Why doesn't everyone speak the same language? It's a very natural question. Uh, this is a fault that many Americans are prone to. We go to other countries, we can't understand why everyone doesn't speak American English. It's very irritating. And of course, wouldn't that be convenient if everyone spoke one language? And another question a slightly older child might ask, well, okay, I could see people speak different languages, but why are they scattered all over the world? Didn't people all live together at one time? This would seem to be a natural assumption, an assumption of a kind of original state. People lived in the same place and they have the same language. So the Bible tells us a story which explains why we have different languages and why we have the dispersion of humanity. So thus far we've looked at Barassus, a Greek Babylonian account of original language and of the way language was brought to humanity. We've looked at the biblical account. And um, I'd like to uh, look at a third account. This is by the Greek historian Herodotus, a great traveler called by some the first historian who in the fifth century BC traveled to the Middle East and spent a considerable amount of time in Egypt. And he wrote a wonderful history of Egypt, sometimes called a, a description of Egypt, which uh, is still one of the world's great travel books. I recommend it to you. In the first few paragraphs of his History of Egypt, he tells the following story. He tells his Greek readers that the Egyptians have this idea that they are the first people. They are the original people. And that their language is the first language. And he relates the annals of a king who he calls Semeticus, he uses a Greek name, who wanted to test this assertion that Egyptian was the oldest language. He, the king, suspected that the language of another people who the Egyptians knew something about, they call them the Phrygians or the Phrygians, some ancient people, this king thought that they might have been the original people and the people of the first language. So the king conducted a scientific experiment. And this is an elegant lead-in to the whole question of science and language. That is, this king in the 5th century BC, well, it was actually before that, because this is when Herodotus recorded it. So sometime before that, he had a scientific notion. This is what he did. He procured two children just born of humble parentage and gave them to a shepherd to be brought up among the flocks. He was ordered never to speak before them, to place them in a sequestered hut, and at proper intervals to bring them goats whose milk they might suck while he was attending to other employments. His object was to know what word they would first pronounce articulately. Great idea. You want to know what the first language is? Lock up two kids, never let them speak, don't speak to them, see what they say. The experiment succeeded to his wish. The shepherd complied with each particular of his directions, and at the end of two years, on his one day opening the door of their apartment, both the children extended their hands towards him as if in supplication, and pronounced the word, Bekos, Bekos, this is all they said again and again, Bekos, Bekos. It did not at first excite his attention, but on their repeating the same expression whenever he appeared, he related the circumstance to his master and at his command brought the children to his presence. So now we have the children brought to the king. When Semeticus had heard them repeat the same word, he endeavored to discover among what people it was in use. 